Welcome to Praise, Prayer and Preaching with the Reverend Dr. Rick Dacey, Senior Minister, Wesley Congregational Life. So as Jean was sharing earlier, we have begun our Easter mission for this year. Our mission to share the Easter message with the people of Sydney and beyond Sydney. And our message this year is a very simple one. For you. For you. That's, that's the message of Easter. And it, it recalls the, the words that Jesus shares as he gathers his disciples for that final meal or that first meal. My body for you. My blood poured out for you. For you, his love for you, his life for you, his sacrifice, his resurrection for you in Christ. You know, we don't have a, a product to sell for Easter mission. We don't have a show bag. We have a gift to share for you. That's the message to the city. That's the message to the people of Australia for you. And so we began with a, with a humble parade recalling Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. We followed that with a, with a family-friendly festival at First Fleet Park, and, and there we, we reached out with a, a sense of joyful generosity from the congregations of Wesley Mission. We, uh, we want our neighbors to know that what Jesus did is not something just for people 2,000 years ago. And it's not just for a select set of holy rollers inside a, a, a church building. No, it, that's why we take this out, out of the church building, why we take it out to Circular Key, why we take it to the nation. Because this is a message for you, for all. There is a danger, of course, in saying for you. There's a danger in how it can be heard. Because, of course, we all know what we want done for us. We all what we know what we want for us. And the consumer culture that we live in taps into that all the time. How many times do we have products and services that are for you? They're so convincing that they have just what, they, what you need for you. This will work for you to clean out these stains. This will work for you to make your life easier. This is for you, and this is not the message that we have for Easter Mission. Jesus is not a wonder product for you, a religion that works for you, that fits into your busy life. No, there's something fundamentally different in what Jesus is doing for you. It may not be to meet our expressed need. It may not be to, to meet what we think we want. As Jesus rides in to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. It's often called his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Can you imagine a scene where, where a great man is riding into, riding into the city and he's flanked by his followers and the, the crowds are, are five deep and they're all reaching out with, with a hope to just, just to be, if not to touch him, to be close to him, to, 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 to soak in some bit of that glory. Can you imagine this man riding into the city who has promised them everything they want, who has promised to restore their pride in themselves, to restore their power, that they're not going to be pushed around anymore, that they are the masters. They're going to be in charge. Can you imagine that parade? That's not Jesus' parade. 
That's a parade into a city like Berlin, into a city like Paris, of the leader who promises you everything you want for you. And who comes riding in with a display of glory that is so impressive. Banners waving. Troops marching. This is a triumphal entry. This is not Jesus' entry. But what the Third Reich, what the Nazis did throughout Europe, they didn't make this up. This had been mastered thousands of years before. It had been mastered By the time Jesus was alive, the Romans had already mastered this art of the triumphal entry. Coming into a city with such power and such prestige that the citizenry would be awed. Who is it who's riding in on this war chariot? Who is it that's going to be running the show from now on? There is no question when there's a triumphal entry. Jesus, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was very different, profoundly different, fundamentally different than the triumphal entry that was perfected by the Romans, that was imitated by so many throughout history, including the Nazis. You know, the, the, the Nazis, they, they, they did know the power of the triumphal entry. They knew, they knew how, how it could impact the citizenry. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem was anything but triumphant. It was, if anything, disappointing. I, I think Mark's gospel does this pretty well. If you, if you look at the different accounts of, of his entry into Jerusalem, if you read Mark's gospel, you see he, he went in, had a look around. It was getting late. They headed back out again. Far from a triumphal entry, but we see it here in Luke as well. His entry was anything but triumphant, at least as the world understands triumph. I, I think it, it is appropriate to borrow that understanding, that term from Bonhoeffer, this was the great disappointment. The great disappointment because Jesus, as a leader, he knew knew how to disappoint the expectations uh, and the demands of his followers. More than anything, his entry into Jerusalem was really, it was an ironic commentary on the the displays of conquering triumphal power that the Romans had perfected. He knew the power of the triumphal entry, and he, you know, he could have put on a display of power that would have been totally overwhelming, far more than all the might of the Romans or the Third Reich or anyone else in history. He could have put on an extraordinary, amazing display of power. He could have come in with a triumph that is beyond our imagination, and yet, he didn't. He didn't show anything at all of his power. He turned triumph on its head. Now, that's not to say his his followers understood that. From their perspective, this parade, this was the culmination of all of the the desires and expectations that they had laid on Jesus. They weren't ready for him to disappoint their expectations. They were ready for him to pay. They were ready for him to come through on what they wanted from him. How about us? As we enter into this holy week, do we have expectations, demands, desires that we are laying on Jesus? Do we have an agenda for him? We will follow you so long as you work for us. Or are we prepared to receive the life 
and the love that he has for you, for us, for me. He's approaching the city gates now, and the crowds cheer him on with, with the words of Isaiah, blessed, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. They're cheering on the, this, this king. They're praising God because they know that he is going to change everything. Yeah, things have gotten pretty bad in this city. A lot of people are doing it tough. There's violence, there's injustice, there's immorality, there's depravity, there's poverty, there's exploitations. But now, now here comes the king who is, who is coming in the name of the Lord. He's going to change things. He's going to make things right. King Jesus, thank God you're here. Hosanna, save us. They're cheering him on because they have seen Jesus' deeds, his deeds of power as he has traveled throughout the region. And now, now he is headed for the big time. Now he is on his way into Jerusalem, the center of religious and political power. And they're cheering him on. They're cheering on God because they know that when Jesus unleashes his power in Jerusalem, well, look out. Look out. Everything changes. They're laying their cloaks before him. They're, they're cutting down the, the branches. They're praising him in adoration because they know this is his moment of glory, his moment of laud and honor. Jesus, the conquering hero, is riding into the city. It's not much of a parade, but they're going to make it one. They're going to pretend that, that this, is a, this is a war chariot. Their expectations are so poured into him of what he's going to do for them. And Jesus' approach into Jerusalem, while it's called the triumphal entry, there is very little triumph from Jesus. You know, when we read uh, what we read tonight in Luke, it, 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 maybe it looks like Jesus is buying into the hype. The Pharisees, the guardians and defenders of the status quo, they demand that Jesus tell his followers to stop the cheering. And, and Jesus says, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. And maybe it seems like he's saying, yeah, you know, they're right. This is my moment of glory. This is my moment of laud and honor. This is my moment of triumphal conquest. conquest. You know, I, I am riding into Jerusalem. I'm going to take charge, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. But that's not what Jesus is doing at all. And we know that if we keep reading. We know that if we read on. If we read on to... Verse 40, we'll keep reading. We keep reading, we see there's a different story than Jesus uh, lifting himself up in triumph. If, if we were to leave it there, if we were to leave it where Jesus says that if, if the, these were silent, the stones would shout out. If we were to leave it there, then, then perhaps we'd be mistaken in, in how he's riding in. But now, how then would we make sense of the rest of the week? How then is it that G this Sunday's joyful shouts of praise turn into Friday's crucified? How do we make sense of that? You know, if we keep reading past 40 and, and, and read verse 41 and the verses that follow, then we see that Jesus' triumphal entry doesn't look triumphal at all. We don't see Jesus, the conquering hero, the riding in with irresistible power and might. No, we see him riding into the city with tears streaming down his cheeks. This is not a show of power. This is the Savior of the world weeping for you, for me, for Jerusalem, for all of 
his so loved world. Tears streaming down his cheeks, openly weeping as he approaches the city gates. And through his tears, we hear him cry for the city he loves. If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now, it is hidden from your eyes. What kind of triumph is this? A triumphal entry is meant to instill awe and fear through a projection of power. But here is a man riding on a humble work animal, weeping with grief over a city that he's approaching. This isn't triumph as the world knows it. This is upside down triumph. Through his tears, he makes it plain that he hasn't come to overwhelm the city with deeds of power. He isn't riding in to seize control and to end all violence and injustice and immorality and depravity and poverty and exploitation. He hasn't come to fix Jerusalem's problems for it. That's not why he's riding in. In fact, through his tears, Jesus says very clearly that Jerusalem's sufferings are going to get a whole lot worse before they get better. And if we read from here to the end of Luke, read read from this passage that we read tonight to the end of Luke, we'll see that from this time, from the time of his so-called triumphal entry, right through to his death, Jesus hardly exercises any deed of power at all. Think about the impact that Jesus could have made if he had gone in Jerusalem and just fed all the hungry. Hmm? Think about the name he could have made for himself if he had just healed all the sick in the city, but he didn't do that. Really, all Jesus does in Jerusalem is teach. This man who had done such extraordinary miracles. Now on the big stage, all he's doing is teaching. Day after day. It's it's a great teaching, mind you. And for a while, the, 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 the crowds are spellbound by it. But after a few days, the people start to realize, hey, you know, Jesus isn't doing any of those deeds of power anymore. Those things that made him famous. Do that one again. Do that feeding the 5,000. Try that again, Jesus. That was, a, that was a real crowd pleaser. No, no. He doesn't. Hey, here he is in Jerusalem with his chance to change everything, and now he's not doing anything more of what made him famous. He's not doing those feedings or healings. He's not doing any more of those great miracles or wonders. He's not doing any of those things that that made them want to sing his praises in the first place. And, and, And now we start to see how the praise turns to crucify. The sick are still sick in Jerusalem, and Jesus hasn't lifted a finger to change that. The hungry are still hungry in Jerusalem, and Jesus hasn't lifted a finger to change that either. The oppressed are still oppressed. The Romans are still in charge, and what has Jesus done but go ahead and and, and say, go ahead and pay Caesar his tax. People are still hurting themselves and others, and Jesus hasn't stopped them. Abusers are still abusing. Liars are still lying. Exploiters are still exploiting. Jesus is doing a lot of teaching about these things. But as day follows day, the people can't help noticing that he hasn't actually changed anything in Jerusalem. By Thursday, those who hailed King Jesus on Sunday are starting to get disappointed. They're starting to get the message that's woven through his teaching. You know, he hasn't come to Jerusalem to single-handedly 
fix everything. Hmm? He hasn't come to Jerusalem to single-handedly repair the brokenness in the world. He's come to bring all who would follow him, including those in this room who would follow him. He's come to bring us face to face with the brokenness within us and around us. He's come into Jerusalem to call us into a whole new way of life, to take our part in God's healing, renewing, reconciling, and redeeming work, a work that is only possible by what he is going to do on Friday. But we have a part. We have a part. And you know, that, that comes as a bit of a shock to those who thought that they would just be cheering Jesus on from the side, cheering him on from the side of the road and, and praising him from a safe distance. This comes as a bit of a shock to those who thought Jesus was going to sort all this out and they could put their feet up. Could that account for it? Could that explain how blessed is the king so quickly turns to crucify him? Luke doesn't answer that, but he does give us a strong hint. Again, it helps to, to hear the whole story and not just a little passage. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, we see a foreshadowing of Jerusalem in Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. It's a foreshadowing of what happens to him. He stands up to teach in his local congregation, Luke tells us, and he casts his mission statement in the words of the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And how do the good people of Nazareth respond? Hmm? Well, be fair, they love it. They love it. The trouble starts when Jesus makes it clear that, that he means to involve them in it as well. He's come to his hometown to confront them with the brokenness of the world and to call them to take their part in God's response. And with that, all of a sudden, the Nazareth congregation goes from singing Jesus' praises to what? To wanting him dead. They want him dead. They literally try to hurl him off a cliff. The first hours of Jesus' ministry give us an insight into what's happening in the final hours. And what's happening in the final hours of Jesus' ministry gives us an insight into what's happening among us now. It's tempting for us to approach this Holy Week as pious spectators or as consumers looking for a God who will work for us. It's tempting to cheer Jesus on on Palm Sunday, to revere Jesus from a distance on Good Friday, to celebrate Jesus from afar on Easter Sunday, but to neglect to hear Jesus in between. It's tempting to make the whole Jerusalem journey about Jesus, all about Jesus, and not about us. To lose sight of the fact that for Jesus it was from the beginning to the end, to the new beginning, all about you, and you, and you, and you, and me, his love for you, his life for you, his sacrifice, his resurrection for you. It's all about us. And that's why we gather all through this week, because Jesus has made it all about us by his life, by his death, by his resurrection. He has made it all about us, not what we want, but what we need at the depths of our soul. 
that reconciling action of God, that grace that makes us who we're intended to be. Because Jesus' story isn't over. It's not done and dusted. It is alive and still unfolding. We who follow Jesus are called to follow in the way of Jesus. We're not called to cheer Jesus on from the sidelines. We're not, we're not called to, to, to sing his praises from a safe distance. We're called to live out our faith as his body, the body of Christ in the world today, to confront the brokenness of this world with his grace and his mercy, to take our part in God's loving response. It is a tremendous privilege and a daunting responsibility. It is something we can only do by his grace. On Thursday afternoon, we will share his body, broken for you, his blood shed for you. On Friday, we'll walk the way of the cross with him, remembering the great love of the one who calls us to take up our cross and follow him. Then on Easter Sunday, we'll gather to sing hallelujah. We'll gather to sing hallelujah because our Redeemer lives. And because our Redeemer lives, we too shall live. Praise God for his love for us, his life for us, his sacrifice, his resurrection for us. Jesus is raised up so that we, his people, might be raised up. Raised up to faithfully bear his name in this city raised up to share good news with the poor, to announce pardon to prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to to set the burdened and battered free, raised up to say, this is God's year. This is God's year to act. For you, his life to share. For you, his life to live. For you, his love to bear. For you, his sacrifice to share. For you, his resurrection, that together with all God's children, we may know the genuine triumph of his love. And that we may fall at his cross and give him praise. May it be so. 